接下来下一场是这个美国网络安全暨基础设施安全局，也就是这个 CISA 的 Thomas Miller 为我们带来的这个呃演讲。那他当会他会就是介绍一些就是说呃这些各种基础设施，无论是亚太区的，还是说在美国遇到的这些呃之类的这种问题，然后他们目前的一些状况。那嗯、um, ，The next session will welcome Thomas Miller from the CISA、uh, to talk about some of the threats that are faced、um, by the infrastructures in in the U.S. and in Asia Pacific. So um, uh, it, it is rare to to have someone、um, this high level、um, from CISA、uh, to talk about something、um, like this, and、um, in the eve of、uh, Thanksgiving. So.、Um, Let's welcome、um, Thomas Miller with a round of applause. Now, we welcome Thomas Miller to the stage. All right. I guess、uh, everybody can hear me now. Do I have an echo there? Yeah, everything is fine. Okay, great.、Um, all right, let's get started.、Um, good,、uh, good morning, I guess, to everyone.、Um, I'm Tom Millar from the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency.、Um, it's a great honor to be able to talk to you、uh, today, and、um, I really hope that、uh, that I give you some information that you can use,、um, as well as give you some、uh, some new information about sort of what my agency is and what we do in the United States,、uh, the, the top threats that we're concerned about. And、uh, and how we can better work together to to deal with those threats、um, going forward. So、um, onto the、uh, onto the presentation, I suppose. So here's、um, here's the outline of what I'm going to talk to to you about today. First, we're going to give a little bit of background about CISA、um, to explain what we are as well as what we are not. Then we're going to talk about the top threat to U.S. critical infrastructure today,、uh, since that's、um, one of the number one things that CISA is responsible for trying to protect in the United States. We're going to talk about different ways we are trying to fight that top threat,、um, going into how we can work together collaboratively, how we already do it in the United States, and how we do it internationally as well. And then I hope we have.、Uh, Then I hope we have a lot of time at the end for、uh, questions and answers as well, because I'm really looking forward to the questions you have, and,、uh, and hopefully I can give you some really informative answers. So, what is CISA? And、uh, we call ourselves the Nation's Risk Advisor. And the reason we say Nation's Risk Advisor is because we are not a we are not a cyber regulator. We don't go around、um, imposing penalties on people for having poor cybersecurity practices.、Um, we do make recommendations on how people can improve their cybersecurity posture.、Uh, we perform assessments. We perform assessments of people's cybersecurity posture、um, to let them know where they can improve. We also perform incident response in case of cybersecurity incidents.、Um, so we and we perform hunts. So when we know about different types of threats and indicators of compromise, we will send teams out to certain organizations to perform a hunt action, which is a proactive way of finding a threat that may already be in your environment that you're not aware of.、Um, and we develop lots and lots of recommendations and guidance that are targeted at different audiences throughout the United States and abroad,、uh, because any of our allies and partners can take advantage of the、uh, the recommendations and the information that we publish. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later on in the presentation today. And hopefully, there's some stuff that you can use as well. And our、um, our key constituents and partners, or stakeholders, as we sometimes say,、uh, include all of the U.S. federal government agencies,、um, with a few exceptions. But the vast majority of the U.S. federal government falls under sort of our purview. And、uh, U.S. critical infrastructure. And the way we divide up critical infrastructure is、uh, there are 16 different sectors within the United States that we're、uh, mostly that we're most concerned with. Those include everything from government facilities,、um, including like schools to healthcare and human services, like hospitals and hospital networks, as well as chemical,、uh, the chemical sector, the energy sector, different types of critical manufacturing, transportation. 
um, and uh, and various others, as you can imagine. So it's a very very broad mission. Uh, we have a wide scope. Um, a lot of a lot of different you know thousands and thousands actually of different organizations that we're trying to help protect from cyber th um, cybersecurity threats as well as um, other types of infrastructure threats. I should point out, like I'm on the I'm definitely on the cybersecurity side. And that's the most important for the talk today, obviously. But we also do things for infrastructure security, like how to secure um, federal buildings or how to secure like uh, broadly attended, uh, widely attended gatherings like um, like sporting events, for example, or something that we're also concerned with protecting. And so that brings us to the number one threat to that critical infrastructure that we're concerned with. The number one cybersecurity threat is definitely ransomware. Um, I even have a colleague who likes to joke that the top three threats to critical infrastructure are ransomware, ransomware, and ransomware. That's because it's disruptive by design. When um, other types of cyber threats uh, commit a compromise of a critical infrastructure network, usually it's not to be disruptive. Maybe they're trying to steal, um, you know, you know, economic intelligence or industrial espionage or something like that. But that doesn't break the infrastructure down. It doesn't cause things to fall out of operations for for a period of time. And uh, and that's a huge concern for us because we know um, in recent cases, we've had uh, incidents that affect uh, energy, food and agriculture supply chain and our hospital networks. And all of those things have led to a really severe cost to our society and our way of, way of life. You can imagine if certain types of food stop becoming available, that makes it difficult for families to feed themselves. Um, when uh, the colonial pipeline incident occurred um, in May of this year, that was a ransomware incident. And that, um, that caused uh, severe impacts to the, uh, to the energy supply chain for a uh, probably half of the east coast of the United States, if not more, for uh, for quite a long period of time. And that was very difficult for people trying to just put gas in their car. And also hospital networks is a huge concern. If ransomware knocks out a single hospital in a region and, uh, and we're already under pressure from the, uh, or strain, I should say, if we're already under strain from the pandemic as it's ongoing, then you can imagine the effects that has on people's health because they can't get, um, they can't get access to treatment as quickly as they would normally because you've got one hospital that's having to redirect patients because they can't support, say, imaging is down, right? Or some other function of the hospital doesn't work because of ransomware. And uh, and these attacks are occurring all the time. They are on a daily basis across all different sectors of critical infrastructure and all different sizes of organizations. Um, it used to be, I think, that uh, we considered ransomware not as great of a threat as it has been in the last couple of years because ransomware mostly targeted smaller organizations and the amounts of money that were being demanded were um, were not as not as large as they are now. So now ransomware is is more disruptive, more sophisticated and um, and they've gotten uh, much more audacious in um, in the different types of organizations that they're targeting for uh, for attacks. So, how do we uh, how do we work together to uh, to de to try and defeat ransomware? So, in the United States, we work with different agencies throughout the uh, throughout the government and with our private sector partners, um, especially in the uh, in cyber threat intelligence, uh, in the IT sector and the telecom sector, to uh, to combat the threat. Uh, our main partner agencies, obviously, are uh, our law enforcement partners. Um, they perform investigations and bring charges and try to interdict and disrupt the uh, the operations of ransomware gangs. Um, so that would be the Federal Bureau of Investigation, as well as the uh, United States Secret Service. And then the Treasury Department can uh, can lay sanctions against uh, against different um, recipients of funds, which means that uh, it becomes illegal to pay those people. And uh, and that's another way that we can uh, possibly disrupt their operations is making it illegal to pay pay them off, so that there's no way for for them to actually collect the ransom. Um, we also work with our defense agencies, um, diplomatic and intelligence agencies, all work together to, uh, as we say, take the fight to the enemy. 
which is to um, to make it clear to uh, to countries that host ransomware activity that it's unacceptable to us, and also where um, where possible, possibly trying to disrupt their infrastructure. And lastly, um, we uh, last but not least, CISA is leading the effort to harden the targets for ransomware. We want to make systems more secure and resilient. Um, and make sure that our critical infrastructure is not a low-hanging fruit for these criminal gangs that are prof profiting off of ransoms. So now I'm going to go into more detail and talk specifically about that effort to, uh, to make systems more secure and resilient and, uh, and walk through some of the resources we've already made available on that front. So this is, um, this is the main page of our stopransomware.gov uh, website which has a huge amount of resources available to everyone for free um, on you know, explaining what ransomware is, obviously, um, helping people respond to ransomware if they've been attacked, and uh, most importantly, helping them prepare and prevent um, their organization from being uh, you know, hit by ransomware in the first place. So we have lots of different resources available on stopransomware.gov. There's um, about a 22-page guide that goes into lots of technical information on how to protect your organization from uh, from ransomware attacks and also includes incident response checklists in case uh, the worst case scenario does happen and you are affected by ransomware. There's also specific guides on this site for different um, audiences like um, I've already talked, uh, talked about healthcare quite a bit. We have a special page for healthcare under this site in the resources section. We have another one for educational organizations because we knew that um, especially when uh, schools started going to uh, mostly remote learning during the, the worst uh, phases of the pandemic here. Um, we were concerned that schools were going to be hit more often by ransomware um, and knocked out of operations. And we, uh, we wanted to help them protect themselves as well. So there's a ton of resources on this site. Um, I, you know, if you are concerned about ransomware or want to just want to learn more about how we're dealing with the threat, I'd advise everyone to try and check it out um, and just browse around or look, use this, you know, the classic search bar to find out if we have anything specific to your industry or sector. Um, next is our bad practices page. This is, um, this is something that we started uh, publishing just very recently. Um, and everybody's heard of best practices. Uh, bad practices are the things that you shouldn't do ever because they're a great way to get compromised. And it's an extremely short list. We told ourselves when we started publishing the bad practices that we wanted to make sure that we didn't get to like any more than seven or so because we didn't want to overwhelm people with all the things not to do. As it stands, there's a list of only three. Um, and I'll tell you right now, they're very simple. The first one is not to use unsupported or end of life software. So no more on-premise Windows, Windows 2008 server, server. We know that the bad guys love that sort of thing when they find it um, during their reconnaissance phase because there's tons of vulnerabilities that are very easily exploited that way. Um, so we want people to try and eliminate as much, eliminate all of the end of life software in their environment um, to the greatest extent possible. And if there is any sort of use case where end of life software is required, and we know that those use cases do exist in critical infrastructure, unfortunately, that those systems are protected and segmented as best as possible. So in case they are compromised, it doesn't lead to a compromise of the rest of the network. The second one, the second bad practice is no use of default, known or unchangeable passwords, um, especially for critical systems, but in any case, uh, we all know that weak passwords are, are a really bad idea, but we know that you know, known default and unchangeable passwords are still a fact of life in a lot of places. So we put that on the bad practices list because again, it's something that the bad guys know how to identify and quickly take advantage of. And then that leads to a compromise of, uh, of your systems and data. And lastly, the third bad practice is uh, is the use of single factor authentication for remote or administrative access. Um, and that means basically that everyone who is um, everyone who is using remote access should be using some kind of token other than just a password uh, to, uh, to authenticate and get access to the network. 
uh, here at the Department of Homeland Security, which is the uh, the parent agency of CISA. Um, everyone uses a, a, a an ID an ID smart card with their uh, with their laptop or or derived credentials with their mobile devices, so that everything is um, everything has at least a second factor of uh, not only something you know, which is your PIN, but also something you have, which is your ID card. So that's how we make sure that everything is multi-factor for our remote access. We encourage everybody else to do similar. Um, again, in some cases, we know none of these are necessarily inexpensive investments for, for people to adopt, but we do know that if you don't avoid the bad practices, again, you will find yourself compromised uh, sooner rather than later um, from our own experiences, our own incident response, and, uh, and as well as the experience of others that we've worked with. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is, uh, is our alerts. Um, we have a system we call the National Cyber Awareness System, which is um, sort of a combination of uh, RSS feeds, social media, and, uh, and email subscription lists, all of which are ways to get access to the same information. And these are all of the alerts that we publish on various things. Here I'm just sharing an alert that we published uh, back in October on the Black Matter ransomware. Um, and uh, we suspect Black Matter is possibly um, a rebranding of another ransomware family that was involved in uh, some pretty critical incidents previously. And, uh, and now we know that this one is, this new rebranded Black Matter ransomware has targeted multiple critical infrastructure entities as well. Um, and, uh, and so we use these alerts to get the word out and share indicators of compromise with our partners and all of the people who subscribe to them. And these are freely available to everyone. So I would suggest if you're, if you're interested in getting free public uh, threat intelligence from CISA or just having a situational awareness of what we're most concerned with on any given moment, um, you can go to our, go to our website and, uh, and sign up for these alerts and, and get them however you want, the RSS or email or just, uh, just follow our social media. But we publish a lot of this type of thing just to make sure everybody else can stay abreast on, uh, on the most emerging threats. And lastly, um, and then we're gonna stop talking about all the free stuff. Um, I wanted to share with you this tool that we've developed and share with everybody, um, which is called the Cybersecurity Evaluation Tool. That's what the CSET stands for. And, um, and the most recent version of it includes a ransomware readiness assessment module. And this is a standalone tool. You can download it and run it whenever you want um, at your leisure. It does not send any data back to CISA. So it, you know, your data that you enter into the assessment tool stays private. Um, and what it is is basically a questionnaire. Um, you run the assessment, answer the questions um, about your own organization and your posture and it will feed back to you a different set of, depending on your answers, it will feed back to you recommendations on, uh, on what you can do to improve your cybersecurity posture and better protect your organization. Um, and so that's all of the stuff that we're doing to, uh, to help shore up sort of like the, uh, the critical infrastructure in the United States, just, in, uh, just sort of independently as CISA but all of this happens in collaboration with our partners. Like I said, in a lot of these cases, when we're you know when we're talking about what really is uh, the bad, what really are the bad practices, or what should we publish in our next alert, or where can we collect the most you know valuable and timely threat intelligence, we're doing that in partnership with um, with allies and uh, allies around the world, um, and with private sector and with our critical infrastructure partners and with our sister agencies and with our counterpart agencies in, uh, in other countries. Um, we know that we have been able to alert potential victims before the ransomware, uh, the ransomware fires, so to speak, or detonates, um, so that you can see, for example, that um, the initial infection or initial compromise will call back to a command and control system. Um, if we work together, we can identify the command and control callback before the ransomware itself has been dropped and detonated. And if we're able to do that, we sometimes have a window of a matter of hours, but we can get the word to certain organizations um, before that detonation um, period 
and they've been able to protect themselves and minimize the impact of the ransomware. So that's been tremendously powerful. Um, we, uh, again, like I said, getting this threat intelligence and compiling all this information and sharing it in a timely fashion, um, all of that is enabled by, uh, enabled by partnerships, both domestic and international. And uh, those can be formal organizations like uh, our information sharing and analysis centers, like, uh, like we have here in the US that represent each sector. Um, information sharing and analysis organizations, which is slightly different, um, are sanctioned a little bit differently by the government, but perform most of the same functions. Um, and all of these are sort of formal membership organizations. Usually there's a, a dues or membership fees um, and you get, you know, sort of nominated into the uh, information sharing and analysis center by your home organization that's paying your dues. Um, and then there's volunteer groups. So there can be people who just meet at conferences like the, this one right here today and form Slack channels or form, uh, uh, form mailing lists or, uh, you know, whatever your communication, uh, your communication channel of choice is and then share in threat intelligence and answer each other's questions and tackle the bad guys together that way. So there's many different ways to um, many different ways to collaborate. We try to leverage um, as many of them as we possibly can within the bounds of the uh, uh, within the bounds of the law, as you can imagine, and uh, and uh, encourage you to also like join your local trust groups, uh, participate in your information sharing and analysis centers or the uh, the counterparts to those in in your countries, and uh, and work with us. So that is. Um, that concludes my prepared remarks for today. Um, I'm sorry if I went through that a little bit quickly, but I wanted to save a lot of time for question and answer. So thank you again for having me. This has been an honor to, uh, to speak today and, um, and really looking forward to your questions. Thank you again. Okay, yeah, so um, thanks again, um, um, Thomas, for coming on the uh, Thanksgiving uh, night. Yep. 那大家有什么问题有想要问他的吗？可以可以就是问中文的也可以。那我我先来问一个问好，问问一个问题好了。So uh, um, I have one question. So uh, just now you mentioned uh, one of the most important thing about uh, the bad practices is to run legacy softwares like Windows Server 2008 or um, those softwares that's not supported. But I think one of the issues that um, I've seen with some of these uh, critical in infrastructure is that those critical infrastructures are underfunded. So there's a problem uh, whereby um, we have a hard time trying to convince them to kind of migrate from these systems. And um, sometimes these systems are running a lot of their um, are tangled with their the rest of their infrastructure. So it, it can be pretty difficult to or costly to do. So um, what's kind of the, the general strategy um, for those, especially for the private entities whereby we cannot just like fund them directly? So one thing we have, um, and uh, <laughs> this is a little, this is gonna be, a, I, I realize, you know, we have, we, have a, we have a lot of different people in the audience here today, but uh, pretend this is kind of an off the record, uh, off the cuff remark. One thing we have started talking about a little bit within within CISA is whether it would help for us to have a grant making authority um, so that we could provide different organizations with um, with funds to um, to improve that situation. Unfortunately, I don't think that solves like just having the money doesn't always solve the problem because uh, it can be a big supply chain problem. I have a. Um, I have a friend of mine who works at a at an academic institution, who was just now um, telling me he was trying to install some completely unsupported version of Windows on onto a machine, um, specifically because it was connected to a milling station. So he works in like the architecture school, and they use a lot of different milling state. They use actual industrial control systems there um, uh, to teach the students how to interact with different types of uh, um, like metalworking tools and lathes and things of that nature. So he's working, he's got to install Windows, I can't remember which version, but it's way out of date. And, um, and it's only because it, the, the software to run the mill or the lathe 
only works on that version of Windows. And we know this is just a microcosm of what the situation is like in critical infrastructure because it's not enough to say, you know, like, oh, you have to invest in this. It's like, can you really replace the machinery? And you may even have machinery that no longer, you know, is no longer supported with, uh, with modern software just because of the supply chain for these devices and how things get, you know, companies get bought or, uh, or you know, they get involved in mergers. All this, all this sort of stuff changes about the economics of, uh, of software and, and what has to work with what. Um, so just having, just being able to throw money at the problem doesn't necessarily, uh, doesn't necessarily solve the issue. Um, what we wanted to do when we published that bad practice though, what we really wanted to, 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 to start was start to have that difficult conversation about, you know, like why is there so much unsupported software, especially in critical infrastructure? And what are the uh, what are the investment decisions that need to be made to change that? Um, and where do they belong in the supply chain? One of the other effects we wanted to have with that with that bad practice was to have a conversation with uh, cybersecurity insurers. So, like, say if a cybersecurity insurance you you ask a cybersecurity insurance company for a policy, and uh, and then they find out you're running a lot of unsupported software then that, you know, that might create um, additional costs for your policy, or you might be deemed uninsurable, period. And that turns, um, that turns investment decisions around very quickly, right? Because you think, oh, I can offset risk by buying cybersecurity insurance. Go find out because we run so much unsupported software, the cybersecurity insurance is now very expensive. Well, we could save money on this investment to buy down risk, by buying down risk in other places. So those are the conversations we were trying to start. And it is a very difficult, um, I guess this long rambling answer is just a way of saying like, yeah, it's a very difficult, complex thing. We tried to boil it down to one bad practice though, to start that conversation about how to solve that uh, difficult problem. Okay, cool. So. Um uh, the general idea is that uh, it, it is a difficult problem and um, we can't just throw money at, at it and we try to set the right incentives like um, having higher insurance pr premiums for, for um, uh, organizations that run these um, legacy softwares. So that's kind of the general idea, right? That's right. Cool.嗯，呀，所以刚才就是我们问他说，呃，就是目前我们这种基础设施常常会有一些跑旧的软体嘛，因为他刚刚有提到其中一个 呃，设给他们对的这种规则，就说，例如说可能会要求说他们要有保自然险，但是这种自然险可能如果发现说你内部有很多旧的设施的话，那呃就会有很贵的这个保险费。那这个上面的老板就会想说，哦，那老保险费
is not done by CISA per se. It's actually done by the inspector general of that agency, which um, which actually gives it a little bit more uh, more weight because uh, you can't run from the expen- inspector general and they will publish what they find if they if it turns out that you're not uh, up to date. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, 那然后线上会众就说也可以透过就是我们slido来这个提问题。那现场大家还有没有什么有想要跟他？哎，好，哎，请。Hey, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, uh thank you for your talk. It's very impressive. Um, uh, but I'm very interested about the ransomware because um, many Taiwan vendor is also being compromised by the ransomware group. Um, in the past we saw that the law enforcement may be useless. Uh in the case of ransomware because they may not locate it in US or Taiwan. So uh, our law enforcement may not have the power to take down them. But however, recently we have noticed that many groups like the Black Matter is being shut down. And uh, it may be cause some pressure from the US law enforcement government. So I would like to know uh, why uh, US government and maybe CISA take an important role here that can take down uh, this ransomware group and why CISA's position uh, when we do this take down operation. Yes, thank you. Can um, the microphone was a little bit distorted on that question. Can uh, can I get okay. a repeat or? Uh, okay. Oh, or, or yeah, or generally, uh, what he's asking is um, how does the U.S. Um, like just now he mentioned that. Uh, um, the, the, the threat actors are not in, in Taiwan or in the U.S. So he's wondering how the U.S. took down those um, ransomware threat actors. Uh, that, that's the, okay, yeah, that's, that's what he's asking. Um, all right, well, so generally uh, we will, for takedowns, which CISA, CISA's role in a takedown is to do victim notification. Um, for um, organizations that are already infected with the, the malicious code that we're concerned about. But um, we work very closely in coordination with our partners who are usually a combination of law enforcement and private sector um, when a takedown occurs. So in most of the cases where we've done takedowns, it's, become, it's be, because of uh, the FBI working together with the private sector in very close coordination. Um, where both both organize, both the private sector side and the FBI will have access to um, to specific information that's really key, and uh, and they share that information and coordinate when they want to do the takedown, and then uh, on a particular a particular date and hour when they've decided they can uh, they can seize all of the evidence that they want to uh, to make the case. <laughs> Excuse me, we. Uh, we, uh, they, they, I should say, big we, not not CISA, but they, the uh, the law enforcement agencies, especially with uh, the cooperation of Interpol, for example, or Europol, um, go in and uh, seize the evidence that they need um, and uh, disrupt the infrastructure. It's it's basically it's a combination of, usually of private sector and law enforcement agencies, and then CISA is basically um, doing domestic victim notification. That's all we do. I see. Yeah, I uh, understand, thank you. And the other small question is that uh, the CISA has a project called uh, Stop Ransomware. And we also know that there are the other group that call uh, Normal Ransom. So uh, what do you think was the difference between these two groups? Yeah. It's clear or? <laughs> I think you're holding. I think you might be holding the microphone a little too close. Oh, too close. Okay. Yeah, is that better? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. My my question is that uh, uh, I know CISA has a project called Stop Ransomware, and uh, we also know that the other group lies called uh, Normal Ransom. And I wonder uh, what's the difference uh, in your opinion between these two groups. Um. Well, Stop Ransomware is our is our page mostly for resources to help you prevent and respond. Um, no More Ransom is uh, largely a group of, it's got Europol involvement, so there are government agencies involved, 
but it's largely a group of private sector uh, partnerships working together. And they are sharing, um, my understanding of uh, No More Ransom is that their main goal is to share as many decryption keys as possible. So that if you are victimized by ransomware, you can visit no more, no more ransom.org and hopefully get the decryption key um, if it's already known. And then, you know, you render the attack. Uh, you can just decrypt all of your data that way. But the thing about publish, the thing about the, uh, the adversaries in this case is that they know, they watch no more ransom and they know when their keys have been published. So it's, it's kind of a, you know, it's a, it's a constant struggle to try and stay ahead of them as soon as, you know, like we publish keys then they change their keys and it's, it's never ending that way. But I admire, I admire the work that they're doing and, uh, and, I think the only I think the only reason that um, we have not I'm actually you know what I'm not really sure what why there's not like a direct partnership between what we're doing on stopransomware.gov and no more ransom .org. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thanks. Okay. How? Um. Thanks. Um. Uh. 那现场大家还有什么问题吗？呃，如果没有的话，那我再再来问一个。Um, I have one, I have another question. So, um, one of the issue with the crypt cryptocurrency or, or ransomware is that uh, the the ransoms are paid through cryptocurrency, and there are advancements in the cryptocurrency space. For instance, uh, right now most of them demand bit uh, bitcoins, um, and bitcoin is traceable, so that that makes law enforcement much easier. Um, but there are um, more anonymous or um, uh, currencies like Monero available. So, um, if uh, say the threat actors say they switch to this sort of uh, more uh, less tra traceable um, cryptocurrencies for their say ransomware operations, uh, what do you think is the um, uh, best response um, in in this kind of situations? Um, I can't very, I can't speak to that very well, unfortunately. Um, I wish I did have more more uh, detailed knowledge of, of that aspect of countering ransomware and disrupting their operations. But that um, those issues uh, fall almost entirely under the uh, under the responsibilities of our law enforcement partners and uh, and the Treasury Department. That's not like CISA doesn't typically um, concern itself with. I mean, we just tell everybody to not pay. That's the official U.S. government policy: is to recommend everybody do not pay the ransom, mm -hmm. um, and that's why StopRansomware.gov is full of so much advice on how to make sure that you've got offline backups so that you can restore yourself back into operations without having to worry about paying the ransom. Um, so we're not too We don't concern ourselves too much with the the aspects of how they're trying to monetize this. We want to prevent the uh, we want to prevent the harm from being done in the first place. Or minimize the harm by making sure everybody has a great incident response plan. I see. So, um, from a CISA standpoint, um, uh, the primary goal is to uh, for to, to enforce, um, maybe recommend um, preventive measures and um, to guide uh, the victims if they if they get hacked, uh, but not deal with the uh, investigations or law enforcement. Right. If you think about it. Um, one metaphor we like to use where for our incident response work is that um uh we are we're more like the emergency emergency services in the fire department um we show up and we want to make sure that everybody is safe and sound and uh and can get out of the building and with you know with all of their loved ones and everybody survives we don't care too much about who did it there's police that show up and that would be our partners in the fbi and they're very concerned with who did it who's responsible, how they're going to build the case and make sure that it never, and make sure that they can't get away with it so they don't do it again. But we're just, we're there to make sure everybody is safe and sound. So that's the difference in our responsibilities when it comes to incident response. That's a very, very, very good analogy. I think a lot of people will understand better that way. Yeah, so he just mentioned that CISA's role is a bit like the fire department. If there's a fire, they would go to the scene to rescue people. So it's like if someone was hit by ransomware, they would rescue the victim. But they still have some things that they have to do. But they still have some things that they have to do. But they still have some things that they have to do. But they still have some things that they have to do. 
呃呃合作伙伴，例如说像消防消防队有这个警察是他们的合作伙伴嘛，警察会把那个凶手找出来，所以那不过这件事情就不是消防员的事情，所以某种程度上来说 ，CISA 不是负责把这个嗯、呃、这个受害这个攻击者找出来的这个这个组织。那嗯、呃，现场大家还有什么想要跟他提问或是想要讨论的？呃，多了解交流的部分嘛。诶、欸，那没有的话，呃，刚才呃 ，slide 上的问题我有一个，那我把它呃、um, 问出来。嗯、um, ，so there is a question from one of our、um, online participants. Um, and um, the, the question is, um, uh, in 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 Taiwan or U.S., we frequently get hacked by um one of the uh st state actors. Um, but I'm not gonna name the country to avoid being Too, pol too political, and um, what's what's the general um, directions or, or guidance on how to prevent those um, state actor um, hacking incidents? Um, I'll have to say this, right? The thing is, is that persist. The reason they're called advanced persistent threats, or the reason we started calling them that, and uh, and I don't think. CISA came up with that term. That was a that was an industry term, and then we just sort of adopted it. Um, but the reason they're called that is because they 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 do use sophisticated tools, but most importantly, they are very persistent. And um, and based on our experience, the thing is is that they they uh, we know from defending our own agencies against these types of nation state sponsored intrusions that if uh. If these types of threats want to get into an agency and find that data, they will spend enough time okay. to uh, they will spend long enough to where they will gain that access. the uh, The most important thing in most cases is to detect it as quickly as possible, and then uh, share that information and eradicate their access as quickly as possible. So it's really about um, for those types of compromises. I don't think prevention is always the Making it difficult is is important, um, but prevention is extremely hard because of how much time they're willing to spend, um, you know, working on fishing your um, staff and employees, um, working on you know like waiting for that one moment when you aren't patched and there's a new zero day that's floating around in the wild, um, developing their own zero days. That is another thing that's extremely difficult to defend against. So all of these things stack in their favor. But the main thing is they they want access for long periods of time. That's why they do these uh, these intrusions because they uh, they want to compromise you and use you for you know use your networks for their own intelligence gathering purposes um, or to uh, you know to preposition malware for you know possibly other purposes down the line. But if you can detect it and eradicate it in a in a quick fashion, then that renders all of their investment uh, you know more or less worthless. So I think. Uh, I think that's the real lesson to learn here from what we've what we've experienced um, helping defend our own agencies here in the United States, and that's why we do a that's why we do a lot of those hunt engagements where we just assume there's already a compromise and we go in looking for it so we can eradicate it um, eradicate it from the network. Okay, cool. That's a very different perspective than well. Um Because I think a lot of the mindsets is to kind of prevent these hacks, but that's a very interesting um, kind of way to view it. Uh, is to get them out if they get in, uh, instead of like trying to stop them from getting in at all. Yeah. Um, 那我再确认一下现场，呃，大家还有没有呃问题想要问的？那没有的话，我们就差不多到这边结束。So I think uh, we're about time. So um, let's uh, end here, and then uh, let's uh, thank uh, Thomas again. Uh, with a round of applause. Oh, thanks. No, thank you. This was uh, this was fun. I had fun. <laughs> <laughs>